Children of narcissists and loss of self. Many children of narcissists feel they don't know who they really are, what their values or needs are, or what they really want out of life. Why does this happen and how do we change it? Hi, my name is Tariana Rocha. I help children of narcissists gain psychological independence from their narcissistic parents so they can create a life based on their actual values and on their inner compass. If this sounds like an interesting topic for you, stick around. Now, we're talking about a sense of self, and that's directly related to something called individuation. Every individual needs to actually become an individual, which means they gain the ability to think and feel for themselves and make decisions that are based on their inner compass and not based on family pressures. When you can both individuate, that is, follow your true values and maintain your emotional connection to your original tribe, this is a case of a probably healthy family dynamic. And a healthy family dynamic will stimulate you to figure out who you are and what you want out of life. And it will do so by not punishing you or withdrawing affection when you try to explore your reality in a way that's different from family norms. Now, in narcissistic family environments, the opposite happens. Any attempt at thinking differently from your original family will probably be punished. You will deal with maybe the silent treatment, maybe with becoming the new scapegoat in the family. Something will go awry when you threaten that routine your narcissistic family has always maintained in order to keep itself intact. To understand this more, we're going to need to cover four topics. First of all, what is individuation? Second of all, what happens in a healthy family when someone tries to individuate? Third, what happens in a narcissistic family system? And fourth, what children of narcissists specifically need to do in order to individuate? So first and foremost, what is individuation? Well, what goes into forming someone's personality and whether they actually become their true personalities or always kind of remain enmeshed with the family system? Well, how does a personality form to begin with? We know that there is a hereditary aspect, so we will inherit genes from our parents. Now, the fact that you were born with a certain characteristic, genetically speaking, does not mean you will actually develop that characteristic. So let's say you have a gene for developing a certain disease. Now, that gene can remain inactive throughout your entire life. So the gene is there, but it's not expressing itself. What will make a gene express itself in terms of being activated or deactivated is actually a lot. Many different things will impact this expression. So things like your diet, the amount of stress that you're subjected to regularly, toxins you might be exposed to, and a number of other things. All of these things can impact genetic expression by activating or deactivating genes. Other than that, we also know there's a nurture aspect that goes into forming someone's personality. So you learn things with your family, you learn things from your culture, from society, from television, from the internet. All of these different things will actually make you into who you are. The thing I want to focus on here, however, is how a narcissistic family can impact your personality and your ability to individuate. According to psychiatrist and creator of family therapy, Murray Bowen, the family works like an emotional unit. This means that there are individuals in the family, but they're all interdependent. So this person impacts this person, who impacts this person, and so on and so forth. So in order for the family system to work, everybody needs to obey some unspoken family rules. And it really can be anything from you're not allowed to have a healthy marriage because your parents didn't, uh, you can't become rich because otherwise you're going to be seen as arrogant, or even you have to follow the family career path, otherwise you will be punished somehow or scapegoated somehow. Now, in this individuation path, we're all born completely enmeshed with our families. As babies, we really are one with our family unit. And what happens in a healthy family system is that as that child grows older, they will have the freedom to explore what their values and interests are, and they will be able to take risks without fearing that they're going to either be punished or um, met with the silent treatment or withdrawal of affection from their family system. Imagine that every time you do something that's a little bit different from what your family expects or demands, that you somehow become ostracized 
it's not easy to deal with, especially when you're a kid and a teenager and you're completely dependent on your family. So individuation means that you can follow your inner compass when it comes to making the decisions regarding things in your life. And you can do this as you maintain a healthy emotional attachment to your family of origin. So individuation has got to do with you following your true values and connecting to your inner compass whenever you need to make a decision throughout your life. And this results in bigger decisions that actually reflect who you are and can therefore promote quality of life in a sense of alignment and meaning. Now, what happens in a healthier family when someone grows up and tries to individuate? According to Sari Gilman's work, we all have an inner compass that points to either yes or no. So it's this inner knowing, this inner intuition, this feeling that lets us know if something is aligned or misaligned with our true values. When you have a relationship, for example, that kind of makes you feel icky inside, or when there's an environment you go to, like maybe your job, and you always feel tense. This is your inner compass telling you there's something wrong there. There's something that's not really aligned with what you wish to experience in that environment. And likewise, our inner compass can also point to yes. Like when you meet up with that one person who's so incredibly light and loving that every time you have contact with them, you feel better afterwards. You feel more aligned, more in touch with yourself. This is your inner compass letting you know that something is right. It's aligned. It makes sense to you personally. Individuation is the freedom your family gives you to follow your inner compass, even if they don't agree. And this freedom is given in healthy families. So as we grow up, there are two major forces that start impacting our decisions. One of them is the force to belong, the need to belong. Now let's remember that humans are packed animals and we actually have a social brain. And what that means is that even if babies get food and they have their basic needs met, like at a physical level, if they don't have human interaction and affection, they will not physically grow. Their brains will not develop normally. So that's what it means to have a social brain. And that's why we all need to belong because this is actually a biological imperative so that we can survive. We need to work as a group in order for people to take care of us when we are completely dependent. We're also subjected to the force of individuation, which is a call to become yourself, to figure out what you actually want to do on planet Earth. What would you do with your life that would make it actually have meaning, that would make you want to be here, that would um, alleviate your, your suffering and make things make sense? You know what I'm saying? So as we search for that personal meaning and that personal expression of who we are, we use our inner compass to make those decisions. And in a healthy family environment, we can use our inner compass and make those decisions with regards to who we really want to be. And we can do this as we maintain our emotional bond with our family. That bond is not threatened. We can be different from the family and the family system can take it. And as a matter of fact, the family can celebrate it. Now, I do want to make it clear that even in healthier family systems, it is true that when somebody starts acting in a way that's very different from what's expected, the initial response generally is something along the lines of you're wrong and we're right. But we do notice that when something is valid in healthier family systems, there is an integration of that new element of that new information into the working of the family. Now, what happens when you try to individuate in a family system where there is a narcissistic parent or caretaker. As we get into this, we really have to take a look into how we develop neurologically speaking. According to trauma specialist Janina Fisher, there's a lot going on in the first few years of life in terms of neurological development. Basically, we're born with premature brains that are going to grow substantially just in the first two, three years of life and onwards up until when we are teenagers and adults, and they can even modify themselves beyond. Now, it's important to understand that anything that happens in these first few years of life in a very repetitive and impactful way will leave its mark in that neurology later on. What I mean is that the way that brain works and that nervous system works is actually going to be impacted by repetitive experiences in these first few years of life. So imagine, for example, a family where there is a very aggressive father who has rage attacks 
and nobody knows when it's going to happen. So everybody has to walk on eggshells and there are moments of calm, but everybody knows that there could be another outburst just around the corner. So it's really hard to relax. People's body were programmed to be able to deal with this type of fight, flight, freeze moments where you think you're really in danger and your body starts reacting that way. We were built to deal with these moments, but the whole idea is you deal with them, right? You get into fight, flight, or freeze mode, and then that gets deactivated when you realize everything is fine, and then you go back to normal. What happens in families with very unstable caretakers is that the children don't have the opportunity to regularly go back to normal. They're constantly walking on eggshells and having to deal with emotional dysregulation of their parents or their caretakers and also demands that are made upon them that are not actually appropriate to their developmental level. It's not something that they can actually realistically do for their family and parents, like take care of their parents' emotional needs. After many years, of dealing with all of this family instability, having strong emotional reactions and not being able to count on mature adults to help them process those reactions and really make sense of them. So over time, all of this walking on eggshell activity will actually alter that child's neurology. They will actually react to things as if they were still children in that same family situation, even though it's like 50 years later and they're at work. The thing is those emotional reactions become so programmed in the way that our bodies and minds work that oftentimes we are adults still having the same sort of emotional reactivity that completely powerless children had. Another way of looking at what I've just described is that this is how emotional triggers are created. Your emotional triggers start very young and they just become activated in the same way for decades. And it's really important to understand these emotional triggers that were kind of implanted by your family environment, because this is actually directly related to why you cannot individuate in peace when you come from a narcissistic family system. So remember that whole thing about the family working as an emotional unit and being interdependent? When children of narcissists finally start noticing that there's something wrong there and that they need to create some distance between their, themselves and their family unit, the family feels it and it does not react well because the family is not differentiated. The individuals that make it up are not individuated and they cannot function independently because they are enmeshed with each other. They really want you to stay where you're at and keep playing that role that everybody depends on you playing. So what happens is that as you try to move towards individuation and following your true values, your family doesn't know how to deal with it. And in this very unconscious way, it will retaliate. And as it retaliates, it recreates all of those triggers that you felt throughout your entire childhood that involved you feeling really scared of being abandoned or punished, feel really guilty for whatever was going on, even though you didn't really understand, really confused, you know, um, like really ashamed of even being yourself. And all of those triggers that were implanted during those first few years of life get activated and they are so strong that you become that little child again and you cannot break free because as you become that child, you just react to your family in the same way you always have. And it's too much. So then what do we do? We just lower our heads and we're like, fine. And we go back to the family system. So if every time you try to individuate in a narcissistic family environment, the system will activate all of your triggers. You become emotionally overwhelmed by that systemic emotional response and you can't think for yourself and do anything for yourself, how do children of narcissists individuate? For children of narcissists to individuate, there's a couple of things that are really important. These two things are really important for anyone who wants to individuate from their families, period. But they're even more important for children of narcissists, psychopaths, and other emotionally immature parents. The first thing is you have to really override your emotional triggers so that you may access your inner compass, discover your true values and build a life that is based on them through your everyday decisions. Now think about it. If when you try to individuate, 
the same emotional triggers that were implanted in you when you were a baby get reactivated and you just go back to the family system. The only way you'll be able to break through is if you learn how to regulate those emotional triggers. It is so incredibly important for all of you and all of us that have issues, mood disorders, personality disorders, neurological issues that make us have very strong dysregulated emotions for us to wrap our minds around how much this keeps us very enmeshed with our families at an emotional functioning level, even if they're dead or we're in no contact. As you learn how to regulate your emotions, and there's a gazillion different ways of doing this, from meditation to listening to music, to doing mindfulness, to doing uh, expressive dancing, there's all sorts of ways of changing your emotional focus and learning how to get grounded, okay? When you finally learn how to do this, you stop reacting according to your triggers. And then, as you are finally calm, and only when you are finally calm, can you actually ask yourself things like, but wait a second, what do I want? What does my inner compass say about this? Does it say yes or no, right? What direction do I want to go in? What are my values? What are my needs? We can't access that if we think we're in danger and that we need to go back to our families because individuation will trigger them and therefore we need to prioritize belonging and lose ourselves in order to belong. When we regulate our emotions and can finally access our inner compass, then we have to do the second thing that I think is really important specifically for children of emotionally immature parents, be them parents who have narcissistic personality disorder or, or are on the narcissism spectrum, or are narcissistic somehow in, in, in the sense that they are so overwhelmed by their inner pain that they can't pay attention to you, or that because they're psychopathic or whatever it is. Children of narcissists need to understand that in their particular case and in situations where the family is so negative that it cannot tolerate someone individuating, they must understand that in order to follow their inner compass and go on that journey of individuation, they must let go of the need to belong. Now in healthier family systems or groups, you can be yourself as you simultaneously are still part of the group. But when we are dealing with an emotionally immature group full of enmeshed members who are not differentiated, your individuation will trigger a response from the family that is something along the lines of you are wrong and you need to go back to doing what we were all doing you're the wrong one. So in order to keep individuating, we must understand that that emotional connection, that belonging is now threatened and we must let go of it. And this does really set off a grieving process where our fantasy of being able to belong as we also try to belong to ourselves gets crushed. Do you understand how important it is to learn how to regulate your emotions, to access your wise inner voice, your inner compass that you can only do when you're nice and calm so that you can make daily decisions that will support your individuation. That's only possible if you let go of the need to belong as you individuate. So I have a few questions for you so we can gauge how your individuation process is going. If you feel comfortable, you can let me know in the comments below. Number one, what sort of techniques do you know and do you use in order to regulate your emotions? Remember, if you know how to regulate your emotions, you know how to deactivate family triggers that were installed in you when you were very young. And you can finally calm down, access your inner compass and think for yourself. So that's the first thing. Do you know any tools to self-regulate? How do you do it in practice? The second question is what will happen in your life if you don't prioritize your individuation? If every time you get emotionally triggered, you go back to acting and thinking and feeling the way the family system wants you to think. What's going to happen to the way you think and feel about yourself and your life in five years time? And the third question is what will happen to the way you think about yourself and feel about yourself and your life and relationships and everything in five years time if you choose to follow your inner compass and learn how to regulate your emotions so that you may actually give yourself the opportunity to individuate. What's your life going to be like if you can learn all that for yourself? Okay, let me know in the comments below. So if you want to know a little bit more about how this individuation from a narcissistic family system process works, there is a free ebook you can download. It's called Narcissistic Families Understand and Overcome. 
If you like this approach and you want to take an even deeper dive into your individuation process, then do check out the Inner Mastery Lab. You can also find out more by clicking the link in the description in this video. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Let me know if any of this made sense, if you have any questions. I love your feedback. Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe and like the video. We love it when you like the video. It really helps us when you like the video. But above all, I like it when you guys comment and I can know how this has impacted you. Thank you so much, guys, and see you next time.